Good evening, everybody. 
I'm glad that you're here. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tracy Metz. I'm the director of the John Adams Institute. And what, I, don't you think our timing is immaculate? As we speak, <laughs> the impeachment trial is going on in the Senate. What better day to talk about the question, how democracies die, together with Harvard professor Daniel Ziblatt. At dinner before this event, we had a really interesting discussion with a group of friends and family members who were at the dinner about whether the Democrats have actually done the right thing in starting this whole impeachment trial. You could come down on the side of the moral high ground and say, they had to. How could they just let all this pass? How could they just ignore this as if this is normal? You could also come down on the side of a more pragmatic approach to politics and say you knew right from the start this was not going to work. Why drag yourself through the mud like this when you know what the outcome is going to be? <laughs> it's for you to say. What I do know is that there is no better backdrop for this evening to talk about um, how democracies die because this didn't start with this administration. I think that's perhaps one of the most important messages of the book How Democracies Die by Daniel Ziblatt and his colleague Steve Levitsky. He will talk about that uh, in his talk and then later in his conversation with our moderator Chris Kaina. Is his message a consolation in these turbulent times that it's not just us, it's not just now? He will show us that the threat to democracy goes back much further. Um, he's a professor of governance at Harvard uh, and I think it's also interesting the fact that he's here, I'd like to tell a little story about how he actually came to be here because so often I get the question, how do you get these people as John Adams? Well, there's no better example than this. I hope I'm not being too frank here, Daniel. Well, <laughs> um, I think when the book just came out, so mid last year, 2018, one of the John Adams uh, fans, as you all are, wrote me a note and say, you gotta get this guy. This is a fantastic book, I've read it, he's perfect for you, you've really gotta make sure that he comes to talk to us. So I dutifully get on the internet, I write an email to his Harvard address. In a couple days I get an answer back from his publisher, who is also his agent, saying, oh, I'm sure Professor Ziblatt would be interested in coming to the John Adams, that's two business tickets and, I don't know, what was it, $25,000 speaking fee. <laughs> <coughs> As you can imagine, <laughs> that was a very short conversation. <laughs> we don't have that kind of money. I mean, even if we did an event like this every day, we still wouldn't have that kind of money. So I said, well, I'm very sorry, thank you very much. And then, to my joy and surprise, a couple of months later, I got a message from Mr. Ziblatt himself saying, I'm teaching in Berlin next year. Maybe I could hop over. And I said, yes, <laughs> hop over. And now he's here, yay. <laughs> How Democracies Die has now been translated into 24 languages. So I think it's clear that this train of thought, this message is important not just to uh, uh, Western countries to the US, but also all over the world. It's also been translated, for example, into Portuguese, uh, Brazilian Portuguese, and Albanian. It has not, however, been translated into Dutch. So what is, I, I hope that doesn't really mean anything. I hope there's a Dutch publisher here or in the, among the many publishers with whom the John Adams works who thinks that this might be a good idea. Unfortunately, the book is not here this evening, but it is at Ateneum Bookstore tomorrow. So I do hope that you'll take the opportunity to buy the English edition. And this time I don't have to say support your Dutch publisher by buying the Dutch edition because there isn't one, but maybe after this evening there will be soon. We are also very thrilled to have as our moderator this evening, Chris Keine. You know him uh, uh, perhaps personally, but you certainly know his voice from Tegelicht and as one of the presenters of the well-known radio program, Mr. Oge Morgen. Uh, he was also our moderator together uh, our, on our evening with George Packer about his book about Richard Holbrook. It was also a memorable evening. Chris was also for many years a member of our board, and I am absolutely thrilled that he's here with us this evening. 
Uh, his introduction, which he will give in a moment, will be on our website tomorrow. And I hope that you'll take the opportunity not only to reread his introduction and reflect on it, but also to look at our upcoming events. I'll say more about that at the end of the evening in my closing remarks. And also to browse our archive of uh, videos with some of the fantastic luminaries and thinkers who have graced the John Adams with their presence through the past 32 years. And now to that rostrum this evening, we're adding Daniel Zublot, and I'm thrilled that you're here. Thank you for coming. And I would now like to give the floor to our moderator, Chris Kaina. Thank you, Tracy. Um, and indeed, it is a memorable moment to uh, discuss what we're going to discuss, because one of the questions in the book is if it is the right decision for the Democrats to start this impeachment procedure. So. We will be talking about that. But first, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, and welcome again, Daniel Ziblet. Um, forgive me for starting this introduction with a little story about myself. I know it's not done, but sometimes temptation is just too strong. And the first thing that came to mind when I was asked to host this evening was uh, the documentary I made exactly to the date 10 years ago in 2010 for VPO's Future Affairs documentary format, uh, Backlight. Um, it ran under the title, After Democracy. And yes, we, we are a future affairs program and there is a morbid streak in our team to look for the holes in the cheese. We're journalists. Um, but to be honest, the title was meant to be provocative. Um, I mean, Barack Obama was still in his first term. Poland was governed by Donald Tusk. Hungary had an administration of technocrats under Gordon Bajnay. I had never heard of him. And Dmitry Medvedev was the president of uh, Russia with fake hope that he would turn the country back in the direction of liberal democracy. And Britain was still firmly rooted in the EU. So I was surprised to find the academics and the political analysts I interviewed for the film, renowned historian of democracy John Keane, uh, Farid Zakaria, an expert on dictatorship, William Dobson, to name a few. They were all too eager to undertake the exploration of a future without democracy as we know it. They didn't think at all it was a provocative idea. They issued sharp warnings. And of course, there was something in the air already then. Public trust in politics and politicians was lower by the year. Membership of political parties was running to an all-time low. The rifts of inequality, the imbalanced effects of globalization and 30 years of free-for-all neoliberalism were starting to take their toll. But still, who would have thought that we would be here where we are now? Well. And I regret post factum not being aware of their scholarship then, but maybe Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblet would have. Because if they make one thing clear in their description of the state of American democracy as we speak, and uh, Tracy was hinting at it, it is that not Donald Trump, or maybe I should say Mitch, Mitch McConnell, um, is the cause for the current situation in which, as they eloquently and convincingly explain in the book, the three main boxes of a political system on its way from a democracy to an autocracy can without hesitation be ticked for the USA in 2020. I'm sure we'll come to speak about these boxes. You'll probably do it in your own talk. Uh, but the fact that all the worrying signs are there now is the result of a process of decades, roughly starting with the appearance on the political stage of Newt Gingrich by the end of the 70s. And I'm sure the roots go back even further in time when we come to speak of it. Secondly, Professor Ziblatt and his co-author Levitsky offer abundant proof for the fact that the decline of a democratic system in modern times, roughly speaking about the last 200 years, into an autocracy or a dictatorship is nothing new. From Mussolini to Hitler, through Juan Perón to Alberto Fujimori and Hugo Chavez, to name but a few, it happened before that modern democracies were destroyed from the inside. Not by a coup, 
but working through its own institutions. And as for the United States, the period after Reconstruction in the south of the USA and politicians like Huey Long and Father Coughlin in the 30s are presented as big warning signs of anti-democratic tendencies that have always been present in the United States of America. Philip Roth's The Plot Against America is only half fiction, or maybe even less. And there's so much more. And with all the analysis and answers there are in the book, there are so many questions that remain as to how the country and the world ended up where it is now and what the prospects are for the future. And last but not least, what actions can be taken to prevent our liberal democracies from sliding down that slope towards autocracy? Two months ago, Tracy said it, I had the privilege of interviewing journalist George Packer here for the John Adams on his wonderful Richard Holbrook biography. And he said, if Donald Trump is a one-term president, I think American democracy can restore itself. If he gets re-elected, I fear it will be damaged beyond repair. Professor Ziblatt, I think we have something to talk about tonight. <laughs> Please have the floor. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. I brought my phone along just in case President Trump gets impeached while we're here. No. Um, so thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you for the invitation to be here. And it really is a great pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to speak to you all uh, this evening. I'm, I am going to talk to you tonight about the dangers facing American democracy today. I'm going to step back from the headlines, as difficult as that is, um, but I think it's actually important to do that. Uh, because I think it's really important to try to think about how we ended up where we are. It's, it's often very tempting, and I find myself falling into this trap of being caught by breaking news alerts and, and the latest headlines and losing sense of the bigger story. And so I want to give us a bit, a bit of a sense of the bigger story this evening, drawing on the book that I wrote with Steve Levitsky. The, the motivation really is that if we are going to understand, if we're going to figure out a way out of the situation in the United States, a way to help repair American democracy, it's really critical to understand the history of how we ended up in this situation. We have to get the history right to understand how to get out of the mess that we're in. So what I'm going to do this evening in my 25 minutes or so is to give you my account of how we ended up in this mess. And I hope in the discussion we can talk about ways out. So I'll begin. I think it's important to put the US in a global context. And any discussion of the American predicament must recognize that there is a global trend taking place. When you look around the world today, it's clear that democracies don't die like they used to. Democracies used to die uh, in the form of military coups. During the Cold War, three quarters of democratic breakdowns took the form of military coups at the hands of men with guns, generals. Since the end of the Cold War, most democracies die in much more subtle ways. They die not at the hands of generals, but rather of presidents, prime minister, elected politicians who use the very institutions of democracy to subvert it. So elections, plebiscites, acts of Congress, Supreme Court rulings. This is Hugo Chavez, Vladimir Putin, Viktor Orban, Erdogan in Turkey. What's so dangerously insidious about this particular mode of democratic death is that it very often happens precisely behind a facade of democracy. So it's hard to see it when it's happening. There are no tanks in the streets. Constitutions remain intact. Congress or parliaments continue to meet. And so as a result of all of this, many citizens aren't aware that it's happening until it's too late. In 2011, so 12 years into Hugo Chavez's presidency, a survey was done in, in Venezuela, and a majority of Venezuelans said in the survey they still lived in a democracy. So understanding that democracies die in this way today is really important, because if the road to democratic death often happens today at the ballot box, one of the keys to prevent this from happening is to prevent autocratic-minded leaders from getting elected in the first place. So to prevent figures like Orban, Putin, Erdogan from using electoral institutions to get elected in the first place. I would argue that the United States failed this task in 2016. 
Now, there are many reasons, of course, why Donald Trump won the election, got elected in 2016. But in, in my book with Steve Levitsky, we focus on one factor that we think doesn't get enough attention. That is how our political parties pick their candidates for the presidency. This is important because historically, the US has actually had an incredible number of demagogues in, their his, in its history. So in the, in the 1920s, um, Henry Ford, the founder of Ford Motor Company, rabid anti-Semite, really had presidential ambitions. Huey Long, as we've just heard in the 1930s, the autocratic governor of Louisiana. Joe McCarthy, George Wallace, the segregationist governor in the 1960s. Each of these figures was very popular. In fact, there's Gallup poll data actually going back to the 1930s. And at their peak points of popularity, each of them had around 30, 35% approval ratings, which is not so far from Donald Trump's base when he was elected president. But none of these figures I just mentioned, despite being very popular, ever made it close to the presidency. These kinds of political figures, though in American history, were kept out not because they weren't popular, they were popular. They were kept out because of the way that political parties in the United States used to pick their candidates for the presidency. So prior to 1972, American presidential candidates were selected in the old convention system in what we often now think of as a system of smoke-filled back rooms. This old convention system was not very democratic, it was not inclusive, it was not transparent, but it was actually a quite effective filtration system. Party leaders, who often worked very closely with potential candidates, knew their strengths, knew their weaknesses, knew how they dealt with stress and adversity, and crucially knew which might be potential demagogues, these were the ones who played a critical role. These, these, these party leaders were, in effect, party gatekeepers. They knew who might be potential demagogues. So despite all of its shortcomings, and, I wouldn't, and there were many, I wouldn't argue that we should go back to a system of smoke-filled rooms, the old convention system had basically a perfect record in keeping demagogues far from power. Now, the primary system, which was adopted in the 1970s, 1972 in the United States, uh, was far more open, far more transparent, far, far more democratic than the old convention system. But it also dramatically weakened the power of party leaders. And we clearly saw this in 2016. Republican party leaders, almost to an individual, despised Donald Trump. They thought he was unfit for office. But they had no means in the primary process to stop him. So primaries, and this is perhaps the least popular part of our book, um, are a double-edged sword. They are more democratic, but they also leave us more vulnerable to demagogues. Had the old convention system been in place in 2016, Donald Trump wouldn't have gotten anywhere near the White House. Now, electing a demagogue, uh, extremist demagogue, is never good for democracy. That's clear. But it doesn't, also, it doesn't condemn us to democratic breakdown. Because this is actually where our political institutions are supposed to come into play. Americans place a lot of faith in their constitution, and there's actually good reason for this. The U.S. has all this written constitution, in some sense the most successful constitution in the world. Our system of checks and balances has constrained many powerful and ambitious presidents. You can think of Andrew Jackson, Teddy Roosevelt, FDR, and of course Nixon. But one of the core messages of our book is that the American constitution, and for that matter any constitution, is not enough to save us. The words on the page, while important, aren't enough. Constitutions actually work best when they are reinforced by unwritten rules, or what we call democratic norms. So our book focuses on two key democratic norms in particular. The first is the norm of what we call mutual toleration, or accepting the legitimacy of our partisan rivals. So this means no matter how much we disagree with, or in fact dislike our partisan rivals, we recognize publicly that they are loyal citizens who have an equal and legitimate right to compete for office, and if they beat us, to govern. In other words, we do not treat our rivals as enemies. The second norm is a little less familiar, perhaps. It's the norm of that we call institutional forbearance. Now, what we mean by forbearance is essentially refraining from exercising one's legal right. It's an act of deliberate self-restraint, an underutilization of one's power. Now, we often don't think about this in politics, but it's absolutely vital. Think about just for a moment what a president in the United States under the Constitution legally is able to do. And we're reminded of this, of course, all the time these days. The president can pardon whoever he or she wants at any point for any reason. 
of any president with a congressional majority constitutionally can pack the Supreme Court. If you don't like how the Supreme Court is ruling, expand it to 11, expand it to 13, fill it with allies. This is all perfectly legal. Or if a president's agenda is stalled in Congress, the president can uh, rule through executive order and declare national emergencies. Again, something we have seen recently. The Constitution doesn't prohibit such action. Think about what Congress can do. Congress can use, and the Senate can use its right of advising consent to block a president, any pick for the cabinet or a Supreme Court of a president. And of course, the House of Representatives can impeach a president on any grounds and the effect it chooses. So my point is that politicians can exploit the letter of the Constitution in ways that totally eviscerate the spirit of the Constitution. This is court packing, partisan impeachments, government shutdowns, national emergencies. This mode of politics is, is a kind of politics that the legal scholar Mark Tushnet calls constitutional hardball. Constitutional hardball. So let me just give you an example of constitutional hardball from a different setting. So Argentina is a country that in 1853 adopted a constitution that was modeled explicitly on the American constitution. One scholar, in fact, actually uh, has identified that two-thirds of the text of the Argentinian constitution was lifted directly from the American constitution. So it's a vir virtual replica of the U.S. constitution. But Juan Perón, when he was elected president in the 1940s, used that very constitution to undermine Argentinian democracy. So one of the first moves that Perón made when elected president in 1946 was to have Congress impeach three out of five uh, Supreme Court justices on grounds of malfeasance, a move that actually was technically legal. Congress then passed a law making it a crime to disrespect the president. So when the opposition leader, uh, Ricardo Balbín, was arrested under this law, he challenged the constitutionality of the law in court. This newly packed Supreme Court upheld the law. All of this, again, was technically legal. So if you look at any failed or failing democracy around the world today or in the past, you'll find an abundance of constitutional hardball. Not only Argentina under Perón, but Spain and Germany in the 1930s, Venezuela under Chavez, contemporary Hungary, Poland, and Turkey. What prevents a constitutional system of checks and balances from descending into this kind of form of constitutional hardball that can wreck a democracy is forbearance. It's a shared commitment to exercising restraint in the exercise of one's institutional prerogatives. It's a shared commitment to the spirit of the law. I'll give you another example from the American setting. If you think about presidential term limits in the United States historically. Uh, prior to 1951, as many of you I'm sure know, for 150 years, the US Constitution placed, placed no limits on how many terms a president could be reelected. So legally, if re-elected, a president could be president for life in the United States before 1951. Famously, of course, George Washington stepped down after two terms. And for nearly 150 years, no president ever even sought a third term, including very ambitious presidents. But it was not the Constitution that prevented this from happening. It was an unwritten rule of self-restraint. So these two norms of mutual toleration and forbearance are what uh, my co-author and I call the soft guardrails of our democracy. They help prevent normal, healthy political competition from spiraling into the kind of partisan fight to the death that wrecked democracy in Europe in the 1930s and Latin America in the 60s and 70s. America hasn't always had uh, this, these soft guardrails. It wasn't born with them. It didn't have them, for instance, in the 1790s when institutional warfare between the Federalists, including John Adams, uh, and the Republicans nearly destroyed the Republic before it even got started. Uh, it didn't certainly have, uh, the US didn't have these soft guard rails in the run-up to the US Civil War. Uh, historian Joanne Freeman has counted in the 1850s, in the lead-up to the Civil War, she counts the number of acts of violence on the floor of Congress, and she discovers instances of fist fights, caning, stabbings. She counts 125 different acts of violence on the floor of the U.S. Congress. Uh, obviously, norms of mutual toleration were not well developed at that moment. <laughs> These norms remained low, of course, during the Civil War and after the Civil War. The late 1860s and early 1870s were replete with hardball politics. An impeachment of a president was launched in 1868, Supreme Court nominees were blocked. Supreme Court size was expanded in 1866 and 1869, and there was a fraudulent presidential election in 1876. But for very tragic reasons, 
that we discuss in our book, beginning in the late 19th century, Democrats and Republicans began to accept one another as legitimate, and they largely avoided destabilizing acts of constitutional hardball. In particular, what prompted this was that Republicans gave up on the cause of reconstruction in the U.S. South, in effect, giving up on the cause of racial equality in the U.S. South. And giving up on the cause of racial equality, this was a kind of tragic truce that we still live with today in the United States. Republicans allowed Democrats to disenfranchise blacks in the South, and so Southern Democrats no longer viewed Republicans as, as an existential threat. Mutual toleration was restored. Forbearance reemerged. So again, a tragic irony of our history is that our norms of mutual toleration and forbearance, which are preconditions for democracy, were established at the price of racial exclusion and single-party rule in the U.S. South. So our democracy was fundamentally incomplete, but this also meant that beginning in the early 20th century, constitutional hardball diminished. There were no impeachments or successful court packings. Senators were judicious in their use of the filibuster and their right of advice and consent, and outside of wartime, presidents avoided acting unilaterally. So for more than a century, from the late 19th century to the late 20th century, our system of checks and balances worked. But again, they worked because they were reinforced by norms of mutual toleration and forbearance. So we show in our book that these norms have been unraveling uh, since the 1990s, over the last quarter century. We argue this style of politics uh, began really in the 1990s, and, we, and we, we don't attribute it to Newt Gingrich, but he's certainly one of the first um, actors who used these strategies that we see more frequently today. Newt Gingrich, who became Speaker of the House of Representatives, in 1995, beginning in the early 1990s, instructed his very self-consciously distributing t audio tapes to his members, Republican members of Congress, instructed his uh, members of co Congress when talking about Democrats in public to use terms like betray, anti-flag, traitor, to describe Republicans. So in other words, he encouraged his Republican allies to abandon the norm of mutual toleration. Gingrich was also a master of constitutional hardball. He engineered the first major government shutdown of the modern era, and three years later, the Republican House carried out a mostly partisan impeachment of Bill Clinton. This was the first presidential impeachment, remember, in 130 years when this happened. Norman erosion really accelerated in the 2000s. Of course, there's elements of tit for tat here, but I think the evidence pretty firmly supports the contention that Republicans were really the first movers. During the Obama era, the Tea Party movement radicalized the Republicans, encouraging them to abandon mutual toleration. Republican leaders like Newt Gingrich, again, Sarah Palin, Rudy Giuliani, Mike Huckabee, told their followers that President Obama didn't love America, that Obama and the Democrats weren't real Americans. The so-called birther movement uh, went a step further, denying that, uh, asserting that uh, President Obama wasn't born in the United States, thereby challenging his basic legitimacy to be, even be president. I'll just give you one example. A Colorado Congressman, Mike Kaufman, declared at one point, I do not know if Barack Obama was born in the United States of America, but I do know this, that in his heart, he's not an American. He's just not an American. Now, Americans have always had an extremist fringe, but this was no longer fringe politics. These were national Republican leaders. This, these were Republicans on live national television at the convention in 2016, chanting lock her up about the Democratic candidate for president. Leading Republicans now were, for the first time in more than a century, denying the legitimacy of their Democratic rivals. Now, all of this is alarming because what we've learned studying other democracies and other places and other times is that in the absence of mutual toleration, if you regard your rival as an enemy, politicians are tempted to abandon forbearance and engage in an escalating spiral of constitutional hardball. When we view our partisan rivals as enemies, when we view them as an existential threat, then of course we grow tempted to use any means necessary to stop them. And that, I think, is what is beginning to happen. When Republicans won control of the, House, uh, the Congress in 2010, they adopted an overt and explicit strategy of obstructionism. There are actually more filibusters during President Obama's second term than all of the years between World War I and the end of the Reagan presidency combined. President Obama responded with constitutional hardball of his own. When Congress refused to pass climate legislation and immigration reform, he circumvented it and made policy via executive order. This action was technically legal, but it clearly violated the spirit of the Constitution. 
And the most stunning act of constitutional hardball of all in the Obama years, I think at least, was the US Senate's uh, 2016 decision not to allow President Obama to even hold hearings to fill the Supreme Court vacancy uh, created by Justice Scalia's death. This move was unprecedented since 1866. Now, all of this was before Donald Trump was elected president. So the problem is not just that Americans elected a demagogue in 2016. It's that we elected a demagogue when the soft guardrails protecting our democracy are becoming unmoored. So why is all of this happening? Well, we argue in our book that what's shredding our norms, what's putting our democracy at risk is polarization. Over the last 25 years, Democrats and Republicans have come to truly fear and loathe one another. In 1960, many of you maybe have heard about these survey results. In 1960, in a survey, 5% of Republicans and 4% of Democrats said they would be displeased if their child married somebody of the other political party. Today, that number is 50%. According to a recent uh, research by political scientist Liliana Mason, about 60% of Democrats and, and Republicans regard the other party as a danger to America. A recent Pew survey shows that 49% of Republicans and 55% of Democrats say the other party makes them afraid. We've not seen this kind of partisan hatred since the end of the 19th century. People don't fear and loathe each other over taxes and health care. Today's partisan differences run much deeper. They're about race, religion, and way of life. America's parties have changed dramatically over the last 50 years. Their names, of course, haven't changed, but they have fundamentally changed in the social coalitions behind them. In the 1960s, the Republicans and the Democrats were culturally and demographically, especially the leadership, quite alike. There were big policy differences, of course, but demographically, they were overwhelmingly, both parties were overwhelmingly white and Christian. Three big changes have occurred over the last half century. First, the civil rights movement and the achievement of full civil rights and voting rights for all Americans in the 1960s led to a massive, although gradual, migration of Southern Democrats to the Republican Party. While at the same time, African Americans, especially in the South, became overwhelmingly Democratic. Second, over the past 50 years, the U.S. experienced a massive wave of immigration. Most of these immigrants ended up in the Democratic Party. And third, by the time of Reagan, evangelical Christians, who until the 1980s had been evenly split actually between the two parties, actually more Democrats than Republicans, by the 1980s they had flocked overwhelmingly, evangelicals had flocked overwhelmingly to the Republican Party. So what, what do these three big changes mean? What it means is that today Democrats and Republicans are racially and culturally incredibly distinct. The Democrats are mostly a kind of rainbow coalition of urban and educated secular whites and ethnic minorities. Nearly half the Democratic Party's voters today are non-white. The Republicans, by contrast, remain overwhelmingly a white and Christian party. This is important because white Christians aren't just any group. They were once the majority, and even more importantly, they used to sit unchallenged atop America's social, economic, cultural, and political hierarchies. They filled the presidency, the Supreme Court, the Congress, governor's mansions. They were the pillars of local communities. They were the CEOs, the newscasters, the movie stars, and the college professors. Those days are long gone. But crucially, they were the face of the Democratic and Republican parties. No longer. Losing a majority and losing one's dominant social status can be deeply threatening. Many Republicans, not all for sure, but many Republican voters feel that the country they grew up in is being taken away from them. This, I think, is ultimately what fills, fuels both the radicalization of the Republican Party and the polarization of our politics. The problem is that extreme polarization can kill democracies. This is a major lesson from the failure of democracies in Europe in the 1930s and South America in the 1960s and 70s, when politics is so deeply polarized that each side views a victory by the other side as intolerable, as beyond the pale, democracy is in trouble. Because when an opposition victory becomes intolerable, you, of course, begin to justify using extraordinary means to stop it. Things like violence, election fraud, coups. This is what wrecked democracy in Spain in the 1930s, Brazil in the 60s, Chile in the 1970s. Of course, Americans haven't reached that point. 
but Americans have reached a point where, according to exit polls in 2016, one out of every four Trump voters, so one out of every four people who voted for Trump, believed he was unfit for office, yet they still preferred him to the Democratic candidate. We've reached a point where, according to Gallup polls over the last several years, Republicans have a more favorable view of Vladimir Putin than of Hillary Clinton. These are dangerous levels of polarization. Donald Trump is a symptom of that polarization, not just a cause of it. And I'm sad to say his departure won't put an end to it. So where does that leave us? I have 25 minutes. What do we do about this? Time for me to sit down. Um, no, I think I would, I'll just conclude by saying um, there's two lessons, and I hope we, we can talk more about these. Two big lessons I would like to just emphasize, re-emphasize from the story that I've just told. First, I think the way our political parties pick our presidential candidates is broken. I'm not sure what the cures are. I don't think we need to go back to the smoke-filled back rooms. But a system that can give us Donald Trump is a system worth visit, revisiting. Uh, as the primary season unfolds in front of us in 2020, I fear sometimes, at my darkest moments, that we're sleepwalking to a similarly disastrous outcome. Second lesson the driver of many of our institutional dysfunctions in the United States is the kind of polarization I've described to you uh, this evening. And I think the chief culprit behind this polarization is the radicalization of the Republican Party. And so any effort to confront America's democratic ills, I think, have to think about these two big problems. These are complicated problems with no single solution, but we need to confront them head on to really begin to address the problems in a serious way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, where to start? Um, why is Donald Trump unfit for office? Uh -huh. um, can I get a drink let of me, water? Let me do this. Yeah. Let okay. me do this. So, um, it's important to distinguish, I think, between policy differences, legitimate policy disagreements, uh, which you know you may dis like somebody's view on taxation or healthcare or even very sensitive topics and more identity related topics like immigration that are within the bounds of normal political competition. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. What I would argue makes somebody unfit for, I mean, there's many things that might make someone unfit for office, but in particular, what really motivated us to write this book was an, uh, the sense that somebody doesn't even play by the democratic rules of the game or it has little commitment to the rules of the game, or outward host, out overt hostility towards the basic rules of the game. Because if you can't even agree on the ground rules, then you can't have a democratic competition. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the thing that motivated us to really write this book was we had read, read this book by Juan Linz, uh, Spanish, great Spanish political scientist uh, who had taught for many years at Yale and studied the breakdown of democracy in the, uh, the interwar years and in uh, Latin America. And he proposed what he called a litmus test. Mm. Um, to identify authoritarian behavior of politicians before they get elected to office. And he, did, he was a brilliant guy and an inspiration for us. His writing wasn't always so clear, um, and it was spread out over many pages, this litmus test, but we condensed it in, into our book, and we kind of come up with this checklist of characteristics. Um, and this is, I think, what you were referring to yeah. in your introduction. So, does a politician uh, condone or accept violence? Uh, does a politician attack civil liberties, such as the media? Does a politician accept the legitimacy of their political rivals, or do they call their, their rivals criminals, uh, agents of foreign powers? And then the fourth criteria that Linz identifies is, do politicians accept the basic rules of the game, of a, of a constitutional order, of a democratic constitutional order? And what Linz said is that if you ever come across a politician who's running for office, who wants to be, run, be it, campaign for office, who meets any of these criteria, you should get nervous. And what was so striking, you know, he wrote this in the 1970s, Donald Trump was not a concept for him, was that Donald Tr Trump checked all of these boxes. Mm -hmm. And so I think any, any politician that checks those boxes, you ought to be worried about. It's no guarantee that they, it's not a foolproof system, it's no guarantee that they'll be a danger to democracy once in office, but it's a pretty good warning system. Yeah, you spoke about the selection process and, and how it failed to uh, 
to stop Donald Trump from from uh, being uh, the, the nominee in uh, 2016. Um, so how come the Republican Party didn't cede it? And why? Because that's what you said. Weren't they able to yeah. uh, to stop him from being the nominee? I think there was two things that happened. One is a very common mistake, and the second is a kind of structural problem. So the common mistake is that, and this is you know, something that we see repeated throughout history, is that when there's a demagogue on the horizon, so one can think of Mussolini in the 1920s, one can think of Hitler in Germany in the late 20s, um, one can think of Chavez. When there's a demagogue on the horizon who has a mass popular appeal, mainstream politicians get nervous, and they often tend to be quite hubristic. They think, aha, here's somebody who's a potential threat, somebody we could potentially use, we can tap into their appeal, and often out of miscalculation or out of opportunism, they think we can tap into this person, we can form alliances. Hmm. Um, what's, you know, and I, I think American politicians weren't used to dealing with this. What's interesting, you know, that we, you see similar things in contemporary Europe as well, in France, you know, with, with uh, Le Pen, and, you know, there, or, you know, Kurt Waldheim when he ran for president in Austria, you know, a while ago. I mean, that, what happens is that I think in Europe, many politicians make the same mistake, but there, there's more of a history um, of this mistake happening, so people are more aware of it. I think most Republicans didn't understand the full scale of the threat and didn't realize the degree to which when they say, oh, well, you know, we can deal with them, we can manage them, to what degree they were just parroting the same things we saw politicians saying in the 1920s and 1930s. And so that, that's the first thing. It's a kind of very human mistake to kind of underestimate the threat and have opportunism to miscalculate. So that, that's one thing. The second big mistake, though, I think is a structural problem, which is that the way our candidates are selected, you, it's very easy for somebody to come in from the outside hmm. and just rise right to the top. Um, and there was a scattered field in And it was a scattered field, that didn't, that didn't help. But I, you know, and what, so we actually tracked over time, I forget if we included this in the book, the number of outsiders, so people who had never held elected office running for the primary since 1972, and that number has increased since 1972. I mean, going back to the 1980s, and, and you had guys like Pat Robertson, and people who had never held elected office, but the number of people not held, holding elected office running in the primaries has increased over time. And so, you know, the fact that in the Democratic primary today, you have Tom Steyer, who's never had elected office, Andrew Yang, you know, who's never held elected office. These kinds of outsiders have always been there, but the system yeah. uh, makes it hard to stop these kinds of figures. Yeah, but, but, but then again, I mean, uh, the Republican Party wasn't really accommodating Donald Trump during the primaries, which, of course, is a competitive period, so you wouldn't expect that, but, but even... Uh, I mean, even after the, the convention, there were moments that, that, I mean, maybe the dime could have uh, fallen to the other, to the other side. The, the grab the pussy uh, tape moment. Yeah. I mean, there that, that was an, eno an enormous yeah. amount of pressure then on, the, on the, the top of the Republican Party to, to stop the candidacy because they thought it was lost. Um, so, so is there a deeper cause, maybe in the line of the fears that you just mm -hmm. mentioned, the, 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 the racial, religious, uh, lifestyle fears in the Republican Party that stopped them from stopping Donald Trump then? Yeah, so certainly, and it, you know, it's not just about the selection of candidates because we see this wave around the world of similar kinds of candidates arising no matter what the democracy is. Um, and so what's driving this is partly these kind of demographic trends that I've emphasized. What's also driving the, this kind of uh, populist wave around the world is also economic, you know, growing economic dislocation driven by increased inequality and uh, declining social mobility, stagnating wages. All of these factors make this terrible brew which demagogues can take advantage of. Um, I guess my point, though, in talking about Huey Long and these other figures, mm. is that I think it's a mistake to somehow assume that we're in a new era mm. where it's a totally different world and none, the old rules of politics don't apply. Um, you know, we've seen these kinds of demagogues before in, in the U.S. and in other countries. And I think really what's changed is the way in which these guys are allowed into office or not. And so mm. that, that's why I'm kind of emphasizing this change. And so, you know, it's, it's, it, sometimes, you know, it's, we, when we talk about the crisis of democracy, it reminds me a little bit of discussions about climate change. It's sort of like history is just moving in this one terrible direction. Things are getting worse. Uh, 
the tides are of disaffection arising. And when it comes to climate change, I agree, I believe that. <laughs> but when it comes to democracy, I don't think that's right. I think oh. it's much more kind of, or you know, or it's the, the better natural kind of world metaphor would be of earthquakes. We kind of live through periods of earthquakes. The question is how well built are our institutions to cope with these shocks? Mm -hmm. And I would say the American uh, party landscape and the, these kind of very weak parties where you can run on your own with your own money, you don't need the party to actually gain the nomination. Um, this makes us vulnerable to these earthquakes. Yeah, because that's another thing you, you uh, state in your book that um, whereas my first hunch would be uh, democracy is in the hands of we the people, so it should be the electorate uh, to stop demagogues, demagogues because we vote for them. You say it's the parties that have to right. protect democracy, not the electorate. Why is that? Yeah, I get, you know, and it's, you know, I could be charged of being an elitist here or something, but I guess the, the voters, of course, matter. But I think voters, it's, it's hard to, you know, the, the tides of voter disaffection move quite slowly, in fact. When you aggregate up every single individual citizen in a the country, there's periods of disaffection, there's periods of satisfaction, Um, and I think really what's changed is the way we select our candidates. And it's a bit of a roll of the dice. I mean, you know, you could say we've changed, our, the U.S. changed the system in 1972. Why is it only in two? And actually in 1972, when this reform was carried out, there were a bunch of political scientists uh, who thought this was a disastrous reform and warned of demagogues. There was what political scientist Nelson Polsby at UC Berkeley who said, you know, this is paving the way for demagogues. You know, it, it, it took him a long time for his prediction to come out true, but I think there was something to it. And so it, it essentially increased the probability that this would happen. This combined with the financial crisis, increased disaffection of voters. I wouldn't den not deny that there's increased dissatisfaction of voters as an outgrowth in the United States of the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. But it just lowers the threshold and makes it easier for these kinds of figures to get it to get in. I mean, to, you know, so it's, again, you know, sometimes when I'm in, um, I've been living in Berlin for the year, and when I make this argument, people say, "Well, this sounds, you know, very elitist." And you, you know, primaries are about letting voters choose the candidates. Yeah. But no German political party, including the Green Party, would ever allow a system like this, where you have Bernie Sanders, who's not even a member of the party running f as a nominee for the party, and the other two guys have never even held elected office in the party, Tom Steyer, Andrew Yang. No party in Europe would allow this. Mm. And so I think the American parties are incredibly open, which in some sense allows, out I mean, it's a double-edged sword. It allows outsiders, it allows somebody like Barack Obama to, be, to win the nomination over Hillary Clinton. That, that may be a good thing, mm. but it has this other side to it. Yeah. On the other hand, as, as you say, Donald Trump is not the cause of this. He, he may be the result of it in a way, but he's also, also riding a wave that, that, that we could have seen coming for a long time. And you, you mentioned polarization and, and uh, uh, mutual uh, tolerance and institutional forbearance that, that were all undermined since, well, Newt Gingrich was Speaker of the House in the book. I see, I think you say since Newt Gingrich entered the political stage, which was by the end of the 70s. But I mean, it wasn't Newt Gingrich. He was riding a wave uh, himself. You, you pointed at demographics now and, and white fear, in fact, uh, which, is, which is a terrible irony because that, that's the same fear as the other period the, after the, the Reconstruction in the end of the 19th century that you mentioned when the Republicans uh, gave up uh, uh, the black vote for, for, for uh, making this truce with the Democrats. I mean. Are we still on square one? Is it still white fear that is determining American politics? Yeah, I mean, it's, this, is, this period is often called the second reconstruction. Um, and I think that's a useful phrase because what that, what that suggests is that, you know, just as the first reconstruction, there's nothing permanent about, about our politics, that it's possible to undo democratic um, reforms. And so the period of the, the passage of the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, It's kind of analogous to, in the 1960s and analogous to a series of constitutional amendments in, in the 1860s, which enfranchised African Americans. Um, what I would hope is that we've learned from that experience and to reduce polarization, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater in effect or you know, uh, carry out a process, uh, reduce our commitment to democratic norms. I mean, I think the implication of our argument is not obviously to, you know, to reduce polarization, we should sh 
stop addressing questions of racial equality. Yeah. The challenge is how to remain committed to racial equality and full democracy, sure. while at the same time maintaining the stability of the system. And, you know, that's a, that's a hard kind of comment to make because it suggests that all these things that we like don't fit together so easily. Um, but the reality, I think, is that, in a, that you know, most democracies don't undergo and this kind of major demographic change and stay democracies. I mean, this is something that's historically unprecedented. It's a real experiment. And I think the U.S. is a country, I would hope the U.S. is a country that can achieve this experiment. And I think, you know, the reason, the reason this is not back to square one is, I mean, we have to remember, the U.S. has never been more democratic. I mean, I have this book with this very dark cover, How Democracies Die, but, you know, we have to remember this country. <laughs> there's, the, there's lighter curvers, yes, too, right. I must the, say the, that. Yeah, yeah, the United States, you know, <laughs> you know the, the, our democracy is not so fundamentally flawed. I mean, the sense that uh, uh, the, the political system that gave rise to Barack Obama, that allowed Barack Obama to be elected president twice, mm. is a system worth defending. Mm -hmm. It's under assault. I think that's right but we're far beyond anything where we were in the 1860s. Yeah, yeah. So if we come to those, those two um, informal norms, so to speak, mm. uh, mutual uh, tolerance and institutional forbearance, you say Newt Gingrich started, started undermining these in, in the 19s when he became Speaker of the House. But what made him think that he could do without these norms? Or what, what, what caused this aggression? if I may put it like yeah. that. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, you know, I think there, there are a couple of things, a couple of ways of thinking about it. One, and, and they're sort of contradictory. So, what, so the first way I think about this is that this is in part driven by the fact that Republicans were out of the House of Representatives, out of control of the House of Representatives for 40 years. And so when one's an outsider of it, so you know, Democrats controlled the House of Representatives for 40 years. This is a uh -huh. long time. Uh -huh. So Republicans had something to complain about. Um, there was some reason to be resentful of this. I mean, if we think of democracy being about turnovers in government, I mean, of course, there were turnovers in government in the Senate and in the, in the presidency, but not in the House of Representatives. When you're an outsider, the way you destroy a system is by attacking the norms undergirding that system. And so I think that's a kind of predictable strategy of outsiders. You destroy, you, you, you attack the legitimacy of the system. You say this system that's excluding us is in some way basically illegitimate. And so it's, it's a predictable response of outsiders. This is why outsiders, you know, some, are, some can be pro-democratic. Sometimes outsiders are smashing undemocratic norms. Not all norms are democratic. You can be smashing undemocratic norms of hierarchy. But outsiders in a democracy often attack democratic norms. And so I think that that's one big part of the story. But I think a second big part of this story is the reason this is an appealing strategy is because in, under conditions of fear and polarization, norms are attacked. I mean, you don't, if you, if you really fear the other side, then this kind of norms, which are regarded as decorum, are regarded as superfluous and as unnecessary and is in fact dangerous. Um, and the, the more heated the fight, the more willing people are to break the rules. Um, mm -hmm. And I, th that, you know, and I guess a another thing that political scientists have really pr pretty clearly demonstrated is that elections have gotten closer. The closer the fight, the more willing people are to break the rules. And so as elections have gotten closer and the stakes are perceived as higher and higher, people are willing to break the rules. And this, you know, it's, it's an understandable strategy, but it's very dangerous for democracy. Mm -hmm. Has there been any opposition in the Republican Party since then against this? Is it, was it recognized yeah. what was happening? You mean beginning of the 90s? By Republicans? Yeah, um, 90s, beginning of this century? Maybe? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, most of them in retirement. I mean, this is, you know, politi <laughs> you know politicians. That, once that happens here too. Yeah, yeah so it's, you know, when the stakes... Become very when, wise all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah. This, when the stakes are lower. <laughs> um, then suddenly uh, it's much easier to be critical. Mm. Um, mm. You know, there's a, you know, William Weld, the former Massachusetts governor, Republican Massachusetts governor is running for uh, in the uh, uh, presidential primary against Donald Trump. I mean, you know, you know, he may do okay in New Hampshire, but it's sort of a lost cause. But, you know, there's, no, there's not much of this. And Even so Bill this Crystal. Is, yes. Well, you know, what's, what's really amazing to me is the degree to which like, intellectuals and thinkers and, and have kind of made these high-profile departures and think that they can kind of create a mass movement. And it really, you know, so my, my, before writing this book, I wrote a book on Germany and, and Britain in the 19, 
from the 1890s through the 1930s, a book on conservative parties in Europe in, in the 19th and 20th centuries. And sometimes when I look at the Republican Party and their efforts to kind of break away and create a kind of uh, competing faction to Trump, Trumpism, it reminds me very much of in Weimar Germany where the Dan Falpe, which was the, 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 the main kind of center-right party, uh, was getting more and more radicalized. There was a media mogul, Alfred Hugenberg, who was pushing the party far to the right. There was these kind of more moderate aristocrats who were no democratic heroes, but these guys basically were willing to go along with the Weimar system. Mm -hmm. Often aristocrats from elite backgrounds, they would break away, they say, okay, we're gonna start our new party. And it would just be them and their friends sitting around in their villas in Berlin, you know, without any voters. Um, you know, and that sometimes reminds me a bit of the kind of situation of Republican thought leaders sort of trying to create a mass yeah. breakaway. But I think this is actually what's necessary. And, and you know, we, it's, there needs to be a kind of movement against this. And eventually, when it becomes too electorally costly for Republican members of Congress to go along with Trump, they'll do this. But until that moment comes, they'll continue to go along with yeah. Trump. Another thing that puzzles me, um, after, after uh, the victory of Barack Obama, if, if demography is such a, an important factor, and I, I think you're absolutely right that it is, it seemed to me that the Republican Party recognized that, that you know, going for uh, a 99.9% .9 white electorate was a doomed strategy, and that they, they, they kind of reflected on their position and, and realized that they had to broaden their base and you know, diversify in, in, in terms of their ele electorate. So how come they yeah. left that strategy again? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. You know, there, there was this autopsy done by the party, yeah. it was called the autopsy, yeah. where they commissioned this major report, this investigation of what had gone wrong, um, and they came to the conclusion, I mean, this is a sort of Bush era Republicans, we need to diversify our party, yeah. reach out to Hispanic voters who might be culturally conservative. Um, this is also, it's in a sense what my co-author and I are recommending the Republican Party to do, so what we're proposing is not so radical, but what was so striking is that there was no mechanism to implement this. And this again speaks to the weakness of political parties. American political parties are not political parties like European political parties are. You can have the, the head of the National Republican Committee, you know, somebody like Michael Steele, who now appears on MSNBC all the time, um, criticizing Trump. You know, he could say, we want to be committed to diversity, but there's no, it's, it's, there's no lever to pull to implement this throughout the, the party. I mean, this is a very fractured and effective Is there less, uh, less of a lever now than there used to be? I think even less of I a I mean, even, yeah. even not talking about the, the smoke-filled back rooms, but yes. let's say 20 years ago. Yes, I think so. I think so for both the Republicans and the Democrats. I mean, there's a couple of things that have hollowed out these parties. I mean, I think American political parties are hollowed out parties. One, the role of outside funding. And so the Supreme Court decision, which allows independent expenditures. I mean, so what this means is that uh -huh. people can give money to candidates not to parties, so why do you need a party? I mean, what lever does the head of the party have? I mean, so t to give you an example of a strong party, in, in Germany, while I've been in Berlin, the, an East German uh, faction, local faction of the CDU, Merkel's party, um, was sort of flirting with the far right party in local politics. The general secretary of the CDU in Berlin made an announcement, you know, under no conditions is this allowed. It put an end to it pretty quickly because these guys, if they have any ambitions, if they want any revenue, money for themselves in future campaigns, you know, maybe doesn't solve the problem forever, but the center has a lever and a big stick and a carrot to hold over party, party leaders at the local level. In the United States, Republic, the national party leaders have no control over, uh, the party bureaucracy has no control over members of Congress or presidential candidates. They have mm. access to their own sources of funding. So I think this is one major source of hollowing out. That's one. A second is, again, this primary process. So one of the major kind of ways in which the Democratic Party has actually gotten much weaker in the last 40 years is until 2000, in, in 2000, until 2016, from 1972, or actually the late 70s to 2016, in, in the Democratic Party, you had this, this system of so-called superdelegates, mm -hmm. where you know, party leaders had a say in the selection of the candidates. You know, members of Congress, mayors, local party officials. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, by calling it superdelegates wasn't a great branding thing. They weren't actually, they didn't call themselves superdelegates. <laughs> the media called them superdelegates. But these were people who, in addition to allowing voters to vote, the party leadership had to say in the selection of the candidates. The Democratic Party, as a result of all of the fights between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, have given that up. So now there are no superdelegates. Uh, so this means the party is also once again even weaker. So that it, so and, and an, a great irony of history is that had there been superdelegates in the Republican Party, it's possible to imagine that Donald Trump wouldn't have been elected, selected Nominee. as the candidate. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what's the Democratic Party's lesson from that experience? Get rid of their own superdelegates. I mean, so you know, in a in a way, I think the that's weakened the party. Yeah. And I, and, I, for, and again, I understand this is a probably an unpopular view, but I think that's, that's a mistake. Yeah. Uh, another thing that, that is quite striking uh, is the fact that, for instance, someone like, like Lindsey Graham, Senator Lindsey Graham, who during the primaries still called Donald Trump an idiot, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Yeah, Word, worse, words, probably. Words, yeah. yeah. <laughs> words to that. Um, he's one of his most staunch yeah. supporters now, and he's not the only one. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's in fact the whole party that acts like that. And, well, there's one reason for it. He's extremely popular within the Republican electorate. So the first question is, how do you explain for his popularity in that electorate? In South Carolina, in Lindsey Graham state. So Lindsey Graham's worried about having a primary challenge against him. And this, again, speaks to the weakness of, weakness of the party, that you know, that there can just be a simply a primary challenge against Lindsey Graham if he pushes too far away. Yeah, no, he's, cer he's certainly popular in South Carolina, but I wouldn't exaggerate Donald Trump's popularity. I mean, he's actually, in fact, in national polls, you know, in... in no, no, in the Republican electorate. In, among in, the Republican electorate, that's right, but it's... But as in national polls, he's among, you know, the least popular presidents at his point in no, the presidency no, know, of, yeah. of all time, right? Yeah. So he's, you know, he's not, he's not somebody who's, you know, has mass appeal on the American electorate. The Republican electorate in some, it, it, part of it is that he's increasingly popular in a smaller number of states. And this has a lot to do with the kind of uh, geography of elections in the United States where you have uh, states without as much population being overrepresented. In the electoral college, in, yeah. In the electoral college as well as in the Senate. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes people talk, when they talk about populism, they talk about kind of tyranny <clears throat> of the majority I think that's a kind of misdiagnosis of the American situation because actually the Republican Party and Donald Trump in particular does not have the support of the majority. I mean, this is really the tyranny mm. of the minority, which we have another word for, which is authoritarianism, right? So, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, but I think the issue is really more we have a kind of ca counter majoritarianism that's built into the American system where these kind of, you know, the fact that he's popular in South Carolina, which maybe isn't that surprising, takes on an exaggerated importance in the national politics because yeah. there's two senators from yeah. South Carolina. Yeah. So if it is not his own party, uh, and, and I mean, maybe we shouldn't focus too much on the person of Donald Trump, but let's take him as an example of, of uh, the, some of the threats that are, are uh, threatening American democracy. But... If it's not his own party uh, that's that's going to stop him, um, well, the second best is uh, the opposition, the Democratic Party. How, how are they doing? You you distinguish in your book between different strategies. One is adopting the strategies of your opponent, going to play institutional hardball too. And your book was written, it was published in January 2018, which is two years ago. And you said then, for instance, and you warned against that strategy. And you said then, for instance, never start an impeachment procedure if it's not heavily bipartisan. Right. Well, here we are, right. Thursday night. Yeah. The Senate's hearing the impeachment arguments. Yeah. Yes. No. Not that's, one that's Republican good, vote in the House. Right. Well, first, I should say about the. I, I, I don't want to say the Republicans are hopeless, you know, because I think in fact. No, no, we'll, can, yeah, we'll come. We'll to come that, back to because I think actually if there's, there's hope. Yeah. I mean, sure. I, you know, they may be hopeless, but I think they're. I mean, without their transformation, I think we're doomed. Yeah. So it's it's an important part of the story. But to focus first on the Democrats, yeah, no. So you know, we make very much strongly make the case against a kind of tit for tat strategy where when one side breaks the rules, then the other side should break the rules, or we warn against it. We say there's a danger to that. And that's drawn from having looked at other countries, Latin American countries in the 60s and 70s, um, other countries around the world where 
When one side breaks the rules, it's incredibly tempting for the other side to break the rules or break the norms at least. Um, and if you don't do it, it's like fighting a fight with one hand tied behind your back. And so it's, it seems like a stupid thing to do. Um, and so we warn against that. Yeah. Um, I think that point still holds. And, and you know, my co-author and I have spent a lot of time um, sort of debating impeachment and trying to figure out what we think about it. And I you know, remained resistant against impeachment really until um, uh, the kind of Ukraine story came out. And even at that point, you know, the, the point is... Just like Nancy Pelosi. Yeah, just like Nancy Pelosi. I, yeah. <laughs> I think she's been, done the right thing. Um, she, she was resistant. I, th I think for the, for, for, good, for the same reasons, possibly. That she understood that it was a dangerous strategy. And I, think it's, I still think it's a dangerous strategy. But there, and my, the point about forbearance and the point about impeachment is not that one never ought, ought not use it. It's certainly, no. it's certainly a constitutional procedure. Yeah. It can't succeed unless it's bipartisan by definition because you need two thirds of the Senate. But you but, explicitly warned in yes, the book against yes, that's right. a, a non-bipartisan yes, impeachment procedure. Right, that's right. And so I think what's happened is at some point the risk becomes so great that one has to be, there's always a cost to using this kind of strategy, but the risk of not carrying out impeachment is so great that it outweighs the cost of carrying out impeachment. So in and, other words, you know, just to remove somebody from office because you don't like what they're doing, because you think their policies are bad or you, you resent them in some way is, is, a, is a reckless act for which there's a, going to be a huge cost, which mm -hmm. is you're undermining the quality of this, the institutions, but the risk is not so great. But in a situation where American elections themselves are being challenged, and the basic fairness of American elections, which was in effect what the Ukraine story is about, is mm -hmm. trying to subvert mm -hmm. the electoral process, mm -hmm. then this is an emergency. And at this point, impeachment becomes necessary. I understand there's a cost to the strategy of impeachment, is, and the cost is that next time around when a Democrat comes into office, the Republicans are going to try to do the same thing to a Democratic president. Understanding that cost... Well, the I cost may be, the cost may be uh, earlier because it's not popular. Yes, but, I, you know, but that's an elect... So there's two different logics here. There's yeah. a logic of, you know, is this help us win the next election or what damage does this do to the institutions? The only point about forbearance is that, you know, politicians, when they normally look at the world, they have this great ledger in their mind of, like, what's going to... You know, I, I, there's certain things I want to do, like I want to get health care for everybody, but there's, is this going to be electorally... Is it, how costly is this going to be? Mm -hmm. What I want to suggest when we talk about institutional forbearance is there should be a third variable that one adds to the equation, which is what is the effect on our institutions? Is what I'm doing going to damage or is it going to reinforce our democratic institutions? Carrying out impeachment may have a damaging effect on our institution, but when weighed against the threat that was posed by Donald Trump's actions in Ukraine, I think it's a cost that is the lesser cost. Yeah, but it, if, it, if it causes, and then we come to the George Packer question, yeah. if it causes the re-election of Donald Trump, yeah. what does that do to the institutions? Yeah. I mean, is he, is he right in saying a, a two-term Donald Trump presidency will do irreparable damage to our democracy? Yeah, I mean, I think what's, what's remarkable is that, you know, I've, I've been at academic conferences where I go around asking people this question, just sort of doing my own informal surveys, and people say this, you know, what people say, I mean, to a, to a person, everybody says, this would be disastrous. And then you look at the polls and you realize there's a 50-50 chance that Trump can be elected, re-elected. So Is that where you are now, 50-50? Yeah, I would say so, I okay. would say so. There's a 50-50 chance that a disastrous outcome can happen. I mean, that's a frightening situation to be in. And how disastrous would that be? Well, it's, um, you know, it, it, it's hard for me to think about how bad it is, honestly. You know, this reminds me of a story. I'm you mean, not, you I'm mean not, psychologically hard, yeah, not yeah, academically? Psychologically, okay. psychologically hard. Okay. I think I, I'm reminded, so I have a friend, Yasha Munk, who has a, who'd be a great to invite to this uh, John Adams Institute, who's written a book. Um, uh, who had a book that came out this, nearly the same time as ours on populism and illiberalism. And I remember the night before the um, presidential election in 2016, he sent me, as a former student of mine, he sent me this, um, he said, this is an op-ed I'm going to submit to the New York Times tomorrow in case Donald Trump wins. And I just, you know, this was like at like 7 p.m. And I thought, what kind of sick <laughs> mind? I can't even, you know, he had this whole thing about what the world will look like and what we should do. And I wasn't in a situation to even imagine that. So I, I had a kind of failure of imagination. Not that I didn't think it was possible, but I couldn't really, 
I didn't want to put myself in the situation of imagine what are the steps that are necessary. Mm. Um, so I, I kind of find myself in a similar situation with the, with the 2020 election. I mean, it's clear the damage would be very, very serious. I mean, we've had, and maybe I'll lay out some of the kind of ways and where, where lay, areas where the damage is, would be most obvious. I guess, first of all, in terms of personnel of the, the rule of law in, our, in the United States. So hmm. we, we have civil servants in the Justice Department, the State Department, who are kind of patiently biding their time. These are the people who make the American state work. I think if Donald That's Trump were to be- the deep state. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, yeah. It was, so, you know, it's, I think it was David Frum who said, whenever anybody says deep state, think rule of law. It's the same thing. <laughs> it's, co it's, it's, um, <laughs> So it's, rule, it's the, the rule of law would be under, and you'd have people retiring. You'd right. have people leave, you'd have a mass mm. exodus. Mm. Mm. So you'd have an increasingly dysfunctional state. Mm. Um, so that's one big kind of area to be nervous about. So I think there are a lot of people who are sort of biding their time, but if this were to suddenly change, they wouldn't be able to bear it anymore. Um, you know, offices, we were talking earlier about the general accounting office, you know, these kind of bureaucratic offices that are crucial for the state, you know, could they continue to exist in the way that we expect them to? Um, uh, the weather service, federal, you know, emergency agencies, I mean, all of these kinds of in, in, uh, agencies and institutions. The court system is another institution mm. where, where, you know, the, the way, you know, studying uh, kind of democratic backsliding around the world, the way in which electoral autocrats entrench themselves in powers by capturing the judicial institutions. And we've seen a massive process of this underway over the last three, four years with the Republican, you know, with the president being able to appoint his supreme his his court appointments not only the supreme court but at, at all branches of government this is where i think you know where you have a basic change in the rules of the game because both the supreme court and the court institutions so these are the things that are these are the kind of ways in which the institutions be permanently damaged let alone the question of you know there are these major glaring policy problems that are confronting the united states and the world like climate change which you know if you you know, turn on American news, all you hear about is Donald Trump. You don't hear about climate, you know, the climate crisis. And so we're distracted he by- He speaks these... about windmills every now and then. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Um, and so we're distracted by, from the real problems that face our society. And so in addition mm -hmm. to all of that, mm -hmm. and so if we have four more years of this, this means these kinds of issues are not going to be addressed as well as income and inequality. So, so I think both the structures of our democracy as well as the basic social problems um, that we confront will not be addressed and will continue to, to kind of, the American democracy will continue to deteriorate in a much more rapid way though, I think. Okay, I have two more questions and then I'll tur turn to the audience. So question one is where lies the hope for the Republican party? Yeah. Yeah, so, I, so there's two different ways of thinking about this. I mean, I, the way I have often thought about this is that Republican party, the part of the reason they are so, they are norm breakers, as I've said, is because of their, they're fearful of demographic change. I mean, yeah. in, order, in order for political parties to play by the rules, democracy requires political parties play by the rules. Um, in order to, no, to play by the rules, you have to, A, and to lo learn how to lose graciously in effect, you need to know, think that you have a chance of winning again in the future, and you have to think that the consequences aren't gonna be so calamitous that it's worth not losing graciously. And I think the Republican Party, although it's in a dominant position, actually doesn't have a very bright future, no. if you look, think demographically That's speaking. what they realized a few years ago. With, right, yeah. that's right. And so, fearful of the future, they're trying to, when, when politicians are fearful of the future, they try to hold on to power now. And this actually reminds me, again, ironically, of German conservatives before 1914, who fearing mass suffrage in the, work, the working class were willing to cheat and to use repression to keep themselves in power. Um, or it, it reminds me of the Southern Democrats after Reconstruction, where an entire racial hierarchy was going to be upended with full democracy. And so I think in a similar way, Republicans are what I'm fearful of, is Republicans fear the future. And so in order for a transformation to take place, they have to be convinced that their strategy doesn't work. And the only way in politics, as in business, as in any walk of life that you realize you're making a mistake is when you fail disastrously, repeatedly. Mm -hmm. So I think Republicans need to face a series of smashing defeats over and over again in order for the message to be brought home that the strategy they're using is not working. Now, you know, this Joe Biden has said something similar like this. Well, maybe Republicans will come to their senses and people say, oh, he's so naive. 
And it may, that may sound unrealistic, but that shows you the dire situation we're in. It's not that I'm wrong, it's just that that shows you the dire situation we're in. Because in order for democracy to work, we need two, at least two parties competing in office. You can't just have a democratic victory and think that all our problems are solved. Because you have to have alternations in government. And so there needs to be another political party, whether it's the Republican Party or another party, that has to come to its senses. And um, you know, so, that, so that's one point. A second point I just would make, and I, just, I would make a plug for a book that I just um, came across by Lee Drutman called the, I think it's something about the doom loop of our two-party system. Lee Drutman is his name, political scientist, in which he argues America needs to adopt some form of proportional representation to break out of a two-party kind of system. Um, being in the Netherlands, I don't need to tell you about the, the strengths and weaknesses of proportional systems. But, you know, that, that's a bit fanciful, although there are kind of small reforms mm, taking place mm, at the state mm. level. Um, ranked order voting is passed in Maine, and so this is something, the way the American mm -hmm. system works. These reforms can take place at the state level, and, gra and so this means members of Congress, the National Congress from Maine are elected according to ranked order voting, and this in principle could lead to kind of break this kind of do two-party doom loop, as he calls it. So that's also possible, but I think yeah. in general, a lot hinges, unfortunately, on the Republican Party. Yeah. But then, uh, as my last question, uh, let's turn to the Democrats, because we've blamed the Republicans now for a lot of things. Yeah. What are the Democrats to blame for? <laughs> what are they to blame for? I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't think they're, you know, they, they, you, can blame, you can say their strategies aren't great for winning, you know, you can criticize their inner party squabbles. Um, I think that the primary system has some serious flaws, and I think that it's kind of preposterous, again, the two pl perfectly plausible senators, Cory Booker and Kamala Harris, drop out. Where I mean, not to pick on Andrew Yang, he's a smart guy and an interesting guy, but Andrew Yang and Tom Steyer, two unelected uh, people who've never held elected office, remain in the race. There's something wrong with our system if that's, and so that's, mm -hmm. I blame the Democrats for that. But I think actually the truth of the matter is the Democratic Party leadership has been remarkably self-restrained. I mean, I think Nancy Pelosi has been incredibly restrained and that a much more reckless Democratic Party could have been very dangerous for this moment. But I think they've abided by democratic norms and played very smart. You know, we'll see if in the end it works. You know, maybe you can invite me back next year and I'll, you know, I'll, be, I'll still be in Berlin perhaps. Um, uh, um, uh, um, but, you know, you if, might I'm be not, German by yeah, then. if I'm not in Berlin, if I'm not in Berlin, I'll be defending Nancy Pelosi's decision. Um, <laughs> okay. So I, but, you know, I think there is, real, I, there is genuine pressure, though, up from the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, for instance. One, just to as a final word here, I mean, there is, you know, a push to expand the size of the Supreme Court. Like some, some Democrats are kind of saying, you know, look, we need to embrace yeah, court yeah, backing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, why are we abiding by the rules? There's, there's a book by a political scientist, uh, and the name of the book is Time to Fight Dirty, which is on the Democratic Party. And, and again, you know, I think it's important to fight hard. Under certain conditions, you need to pursue impeachment, but we have to be aware of the costs of these kinds of strategies. And I think it's insane to be, as a Democrat, making the case for expanding the size of the Supreme Court when Democrats are in control of neither the Senate or the presidency. Mm. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> it's like so, so, um, it's like abolishing the sixty percent for the filibuster. Yeah, like you know what, so, what right. Harry Reid did. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're and when you're in the when you're in the opposition in particular, but I think in general it's a it's a kind of dangerous precedent. So there are elements in the Democratic Party. It's not a left-right issue. It's about it's about the willingness to abide by our democratic institutions. It also this also doesn't mean we, there can't be reforms. I'm open to ranked order voting or maybe thinking of abolishing the electoral college and these kinds of reforms. But I think there needs to be a recognition that the institutions that gave us Barack Obama are worth defending. In the audience, I see a, f a hand over there. Wait for the microphone and please say who you are. Hi, I'm Pat Lerner. I'm a retired Foreign Service officer, uh, now working for Greenpeace International on climate change. So thank you very much, Professor Ziblatt. Hugely important book, very readable. I have a dark cover here. <laughs> My question to you has to do with your last chapter on saving democracy, which I thought was a rather short chapter, but <laughs> you've addressed most of the issues that in the panel discussion. My question has to do with um, where you talk about Mark Penn challenging the Democrats to put aside identity politics in the name of 
getting elected. This is about power. And of course, Francis Fukuyama, Mark Leela, others have come in, out in support of um, Mark Penn. You and your co-authors say you think it's a terrible idea, and I understand from a historical standpoint, from a moral perspective, traditions, everything that you have just said, institutions rather. The question is, if you say it's 50-50, and this is about power and getting elected, how do you do the math if the Democrats don't do something that will appeal to white middle class voters? How do we get to where I think most of the world, not just American voters, want to change things? If I may add to that, is there a strategy that, that combines both maybe? Not completely uh, leaving identity politics or addressing a, a diverse electorate and winning back uh, the white blue collar votes they lost. Yeah, I, I think, you know, in, in many ways, the Obama coalition was exactly that coalition. It was able to hold together a very diverse coalition of voters. Um, the, what makes me nervous, I mean, I, I think on the one hand, I would say that, you know, the kind of picture of identity politics that one often kind of reads about in the media, I would reject as well, which is, you know, that we focus on group identity over common interests and so on. I mean, I think that all makes sense. But I, th I think the role of identity politics in the Democratic Party is not as great as it's sometimes portrayed in, in the media. Um, you know, I think, you know, there, there are, if you think of, again, of the Democratic Party leadership, they have a very big tent approach to, to politics. I mean, they understand that pe people running in different districts have different kinds of constituencies. And so if you're from a rural Pennsylvania district where um, uh, abortion is not particularly popular, you can allow a Democrat to run on that issue in his congressional district. If you come from the Bronx um, and you uh, have a different set of voters, then you should kind of run on that, those sets of issues. The Democratic Party is a big tent and it should contain all of those elements. Um, what, I, what, I, what makes me nervous about the kind of criticism of identity politics is that it sometimes has the flavor of, well, we should give up, or at the form of identity, the form of rejecting identity politics that I don't like is the idea that maybe we should stop emphasizing racial equality so hmm. much. Because what that in effect is, is in, sounds to me a little bit too much like the effort to turn back reconstruction. Now, I'm not saying that anybody who's a critic of identity politics is a kind of segregationist, but on the other hand, we should be aware of that risk. And that often, what, and actually there's a wonderful essay by Stacey Abrams that I would recommend that, you, that people look at in Foreign Affairs, where it's a critique of Francis Fukuyama's book. And she makes the argument that what people often call identity politics is actually a call for equality. Um, and, you know, of course we want to emphasize common interests, I think that's right, and it's a mistake to emphasize just individual group interests, but you wanna in emphasize people's commonality. And if one way of doing that is, by, and so, so anyway, that, that's the kind of my, my general kind of nervousness about criticizing identity politics. Just as a general electoral strategy, I think this kind of pursuit of, the idea that there's a trade-off and that we need to pursue white working class voters, even if that means not paying attention to African American voters. We have to remember that African American or that non-white voters are 50% of the Democratic Party. And so, you know, the, the turnout, so just as a strategic question, if I were advising a politician, you know, you may gain some votes on this side, but you're likely to lose a lot of votes in terms of turnout on the other side. So there's a calculus that has to be made. So I think the solution clearly is to try to create an all-encompassing coalition that's a broad tent coalition. And I think that can be done in, in very subtle and careful ways. And that's what you know, politicians, you know, good politicians have to be able to do. Um, and I think Barack Obama was able to hold that coalition together. And I think in looking at the Democratic nominees, for uh, president, that's kind of, you know, that's sort of what makes me nervous. It's, you know, you try to have to try to find who is the candidate that can do that. Because I think that's really the, the kind of silver bullet for, for the Democrats, is, which, which is to kind of emphasize people's common interests um, in a way that doesn't drive people apart. The gentleman over here. My name is Gene Dye. I'm a retired lawyer and teacher of law. And in listening to your wonderful 
analysis of the existing political situation in America and its evolution. Uh, I, I come to uh, wonder what you think of two new sources of force, which I think have manifested themselves um, in a totally new manner in the last 12 to 15 years. One you touched on briefly, which is the unconstrained ability of people to give an unlimited amount of money to promote their ideological preferences. The second, which I don't think has been mentioned at all, is the as yet understood but enormous power of digital information and the internet, um, social networks. We know only, we see only the tip of the iceberg that people have been able to use those means very successfully to manipulate voter choices and indeed preferences as expressed by people when questioned across a variety of different uh, questions. And if that's true, then uh, uh, do you think that forbearance, which I agree is an absolute necessity for civilization, has become uh, irrelevant because there's no more accountability? In other words, the political power has been given over to people with an unlimited amount of money and the ability to manipulate the information system. And if so, do you think that the existing American system has any possibility of curing itself? You have one minute. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I, I mean, one, so I, these are two very important factors, clearly. I mean, that's why I brought my phone again with me. I'm ready you know, for my Twitter <laughs> feed to explode here. But uh, I, I think one way, one way, what I can add to your comment, I think it was a, a great comment, what I would add to it is that these two factors that you've identified weaken establishment institutions. In, a, in, a, in some ways, people can make the case that it's democratizing, I think in a very pernicious way. And so let me first just say in what sense it's democratizing. I mean, if you think of the kind of post-war period in both Europe and the United States and all advanced democracies, this is a world in which you had a couple of television stations, a couple of newspapers. Um, if you're a politician running to run for office, you have to get the approval of some of the, the media you know, institutions. You have to get the approval, and then when it comes to financing your campaign, you have to rely on labor unions, employer associations, well-organized establishment interest groups, as well as political parties, establishment political parties. In a way, the door has been opened. Now, if you're a politician running for office, like Donald Trump or anybody, any kind of populist uh, in, in Europe today as well, you don't necessarily need the approval. In fact, you, it's a better to not get the approval of mainstream uh, media institutions because you can, circumvent, you can circumvent media institutions through social media. And so this is in a certain way democratizing, one might say, because it's easier for people to, it equalizes the playing field. Now, I think it, it also opens the door to demagogues. So this is, in some sense, the, the, and a similar story could be told about money. I mean, clearly somebody like Tom Steyer or Michael Bloomberg with their billions of dollars, this is not particularly democratic. But what's also important to remember is that Bernie Sanders, Bernie Sanders, the socialist, raised more money than Hillary Clinton in the 2016 campaign. Okay, from small donors. So this opens the door. Now, again, I think in both cases, so it's, I, I'm saying in a certain way, provocatively, that it's more democratic, but it also opens the door to demagogues, to people who then come in and attack our democratic institution. So I think the great paradox that we live with today is that these kind of, this opening of our system is also threatening our system. So how do we cope with that? I mean, I think that's really, that's really the kind of central, the central challenge that all of our democracies face. You know, whether, again, in, just to, take a, to take another example, the, you know, the AFD in Germany, I was doing some interviews with um, some journalists with a, a couple of different newspapers and media outlets, and they say the AFD, so the far-right party alternative for Germany, say, you know, they don't talk to us anymore because they realize they don't need us anymore. You know, they have their own YouTube channel, they can you know, circumvent, circumvent the media. So again, this is an op opening the door. This applies both to Europe and the United States, and I think this is kind of one of the central issues of our time. And, and if I may add, uh, as for traditional media, would we have had Donald Trump without Fox News? Um, you know, interestingly, he had a kind of contentious relationship with Fox News early on. So, um, and, you know, he, and he's starting to have one again. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. No, I mean, you know, I think Fox News has had, you know, it's hard to answer that question, but I do think that Fox News has undoubtedly had uh, 
an incredibly negative effect on American politics. And it's important to also recognize that the existence of Fox News didn't, it didn't just drop from heaven. There was a regulatory change that allowed for news media to no longer be fair and balanced, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which was the kind of legal requirement. Once this was abolished in the late 1980s, they adopted the slogan for themselves, fair and balanced. And so it's a, regula a ch regulatory change that opened the door for this. Okay. Anybody? Over here. Please wait for the mic. Uh, Paul Koster, I'm curious, how do you weigh the upcoming decision in the Supreme Court on Donald Trump tax forms, and will it play a role in the election year? Is it still possible that it would play a role? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know what the outcome of that will be. I mean, I think it, it it's, I, I mean, I imagine that it would play a big role, but on the way over here, we were talking, and this kind of, that, you know, we keep waiting for the tipping point. <laughs> Um, the John Dean. The straw that break, breaks the camel's back. Um, and it kind of reminds me a little bit in math class in high school where you studied, somebody in this room will know what this is, where you keep getting closer to the line, but you never quite meet the line, you know. Um, and we sort of keep wait, waiting for the turning point to come. And I think this, you know, this could, this could be one, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of these moments. And I think it's hard to, hard to predict whether this will be one of the turning points. Um, one, one point I just want to, because I'm, as I'm talking, I'm sort of thinking about the question back about the identity politics. I kind of got distracted about identity politics because I think there's one point that it's worth coming back to, if I may. You know, I, I wonder to what degree um, the kind of coalition, given, let me put it this way, I mean, given that there's a 50-50 chance that we're going to have this calamitous outcome, you know, what should we do about it? You know, is it enough just to let the process, the, the, the kind of primary process unfold as it is? And I, you know, I've heard people talk about, you know, way in which, you know, maybe, a, you know, I'm not advocating this, but just suggesting this is, I've heard people make this argument that there needs to be a kind of bipartisan government formed ahead of time, before the election, a cabinet formed of Republicans and Democrats. Um, you know, which always happens to some degree you know, where you have a Republican appointed Secretary of Defense, that sort of seems to be the default mode. But is there a way in which- You mean as a gesture from the Democrats to, a, to, to the, the Republicans? Republicans. Okay. To, to the Republicans. So in other words, you know, there's, you know, in the, in the you know, we, we make the case often that Republicans need to step up and huh? look out for the national yeah, interest. The question is, what are Democrats doing to step yeah. up? What compromises are Democrats willing to make? Offer a hand. Yeah, yeah. to prevent uh, Donald Trump from being elected. Mm. You know, does this mean making personnel kinds of compromises? Does this mean making programmatic compromises? Mm. What those programmatic compromises are, I'm not quite sure, but maybe those kinds of things might be necessary. If, if the threat is as serious as we say it is, and there's a 50-50 chance that it's going to come, you know, what compromises are, are Democrats willing to uh, endure in order to prevent that outcome from happening. And so I think that's a, just a question worth reflecting on. I think I saw a question over here. And then maybe one final one, Tracy, are we? Yeah, are we okay on time? Um, my name is Adrian Janssen. Thank you very much for your lecture. Um, you've talked a lot about uh, the current situation in America where democracy is under stress. Of course, that's happened in the past, the, the McCarthy period. And you mentioned even today, earlier periods in the 20th century and the late 19th century. American democracy has bounced back from those periods. What kind of factors, according to you, contributed to that bounce back? And do you see some of those factors now? And how could we um, stimulate or incentivize those kind of factors? So looking beyond Trump on how can we do uh, the real restoration of American right. democracy? Yeah, good, thank you for asking. Good question to reflect on some positive scenarios. I mean, I think, <laughs> I think, I think there's, two, there's two different kinds of lessons one can draw, both from other countries, I'm a comparativist, so I think about other countries, as well as from American history itself. The bad news, I'll begin with the bad news and then go to the good news. The bad news is that when one really looks around the world, when countries kind of enter this spiral of polarization, it's really hard to think, when people say, well, are there countries that have escaped out of this spiral of polarization? <clears throat> it's actually very hard to think of countries that have broken out of the spiral without calamity. So if one thinks of, let's say, Chile in the 1970s, um, you know, and, or, or Spain, um, you know, where you have the devastation of an authoritarian rule, and then what happens is people who were formerly rivals 
you know, in Chile, you know, socialists and Christian Democrats get together, like, you know, I mean, the, the stories that I've read is, you know, for, lead, former leaders in the Christian Democrats and the socialists who were fighting with each other and allowed Pinochet to come to power, you know, were in, in the United States on sabbatical at University of North Carolina and had lunch every day and realized, God, what, 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 what were we thinking? It's time to kind of overcome our differences. Um, uh, you can think of kind of, you know, the Spanish transition to democracy where, again, socialists and conservatives overcome their differences, but these are, or, or the travesty of, of World War II and the you know, Protestant Catholic divide in Germany is finally overcome in the form of the Christian Democratic Party after World War II. And, and I think what often happens in these scenarios is, is that people suffer together, are persecuted together, and find a kind of commonality and can break out of the kind of Psycho polarization, but the, but you know the, your question is not so dire because your point is how do we avoid that fate of a cal calamity, world war, authoritarianism? How do we sidestep that problem? And I think the first thing is to learn from those experiences. So that's part of the reason we wrote the book was to try to you know to say that there you know that this is the path we're on. How do we avoid that going all the way into the abyss before? learning the lesson, so that's the first point. But I think in American history, I mean, if we compare this to, let's say, the Nixon era, I think that's a major comparison that's often made and one can think about, you know, that Nixon, in many ways, had, you know, lots of authoritarian tendencies, um, was carrying out, was on, on the verge of kind of carrying out, began to carry out a kind of criminal kind of regime at some level, um, investigating opposition and dirty tricks and so on. Um, and one of the things that emerged out of that period was a, a remarkable period of reform where all sorts of laws were passed in the early kind of post-Watergate Congress. Um, and in particular, it's what, what happened, and I think we see discussion of this happening now, um, is a recognition that many of these things that I've talked about as norms, unwritten rules in the American political system, people realize these soft guardrails aren't enough. We need to harden the soft guardrails. So for instance, we need to have much stricter laws about conflict of interests. We, maybe we should formalize the number of uh, judges on the Supreme Court. All of these things that we leave to the realm of kind of good behavior maybe need to be formalized. And so that's, that, so, um, you know, one can imagine, and I think there is lots of discussion of kind of formalizing and a kind of legislative reform agenda that could help us kind of overcome some of these divides. And then just the final point I would say is that I actually, and this is maybe a stretch, but I think there's something, there's a kind of interesting analogy. I sometimes think of the kind of history of Germany and France after World War II and the formation of the European st uh, steel and coal community, where German bureaucrats and French bureaucrats got together to solve very technical problems. Mm. And in the process built trust. And the, the great genius of the Europe, process of European integration was to solve problems and in the process create the need for more cooperation and so the zone of trust could expand. And I think what needs to happen among Democrats and Republicans is to find areas of cooperation, small areas of cooperation, out of the limelight, maybe at the state level, maybe at the local level, and to expand those areas of trust and cooperation. And I think there, there are people working on these kinds of things. And so this, I think, has to, this can't happen in a national spotlight. This has to happen out of the spotlight. But I think this is the area in which kind of reform uh, comes. One last question. Over here. Yes. So I'll give, uh, my answers are long. Um, my name is Everett, and I am a student. Um, thank you for your speech. And my question is, um, do non-state actors have the same capabilities, or non-state actors in specifically, which are not bound together by any sort of charter, or, or they are, however, bound together by some extent of unwritten rules, which you mentioned in your speech? Um, did, do you believe that they have the same capacity as states to create democracies and lose them, like go through the same democratic process hmm. as states. Yeah, so what, do you have one in mind? Uh, not, not in particular, but. Do you wanna give, do, but can you give me an example? Sorry. It's easier to answer, no? Or non-state actors that have, that claim to fight for democratic purposes, for example, rebel groups. Aha, I see, okay. Yes, yeah, no, um, yeah, thank you for the question. 
Um, I mean, I, what I'm, when I'm talking about democracies, I am talking about nation states here. In, I mean, first of all, in the, Europe, in the context of the European Union, you know, some people may say, well, it's, we should be talking about Europe, not nation states. Coming from the other side, one may talk about all sorts of social institutions in society, whether one's talking about the classroom, schools, families, rebel groups, these are non-state actors. Um, and the question is, should these same rules of democracy apply to these institutions? And you know, you can ask my daughters, I don't run my family particularly democratically. Um, uh, <laughs> so I don't think all social institutions are always run democratically, but you know, I think the, I guess the, the big difference between government institutions and non-government institutions is the coercive apparatus. I mean, so Max Weber has this famous definition of the state as the entity with the monopoly on the legitimate use of force. So I think ultimately the fact that states have a coercive apparatus, that, that Donald Trump or any president has the power of, of nuclear weapons as well as the power of a police force behind them makes these issues particularly sensitive because if there isn't accountability, it's, it's incredibly dangerous. Non-state actors, by and large, one can exit from them. But often, I mean, I jokingly said I'll move to Berlin, but the reality is, you know, that's not, that's not real. It's, it's sort of an implausible option for most people. Non-state actors, you have the, exit, the option of exit. State actors, you don't usually have the, exit of, the option of exit. You, you're stuck with the leaders you, you have. And so I think the stakes are even higher for state, state actors. Although certainly the same categories could be used to analyze, I think, uh, non-state actors. On that, I thank you very much for your attention. And Professor Zibler, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. I learned a lot this evening. And I'm not gonna go home and commit suicide, which is also a good thing. <laughs> I leave here with more hope than I dared to expect. And I even learned some new words. Court packing, uh, constitutional hardball. Uh, these are things that I'll take with me for a long time to come. Uh, I have a couple things to tell you. Two are uh, the upcoming events that we have next week already on the 21st. We're wel welcoming Meg Waite Clayton to talk to us about her book uh, about the rescue of Jewish children just before the war who were taken to London. Her book is called in English, uh, Last Train to London, by a woman, a brave woman, whose name you may recognize, Trus Weissmuller, who was later one of the founders of the Anne Frank Foundation. And the moderator will be the director of the Anne Frank Foundation, Ronald Leopold, who is also here with us this evening. Ronald. We're looking forward to that. Thank you for uh, helping us make this happen. And on Super Tuesday, we'll be welcoming an expert on the Constitution. I don't think my whole life, living in America, living in the Netherlands, I've ever heard the Constitution talked about so much mm -hmm. as the last couple of years. We'll be welcoming Kim Whaley. She's an expert on the Constitution, and the title of her book is how to read the Constitution and why. And of course, the why is really important now. Because I have learned this evening, I learned a new motto for the evening. Uh, we've seen how political parties have in many ways wrested power from the voters. And we think it's important to make voters matter again. And that's why the Democrats abroad, voter vote from abroad, are out here with a, a stand this evening it's a do or die for American voters this year. Seven million American citizens live abroad here in the Netherlands, and all around the globe, we get to have our say too. <laughs> a, lot of Americans, a lot of Americans outside the country may not realize that they can vote or know how to do it. So there are volunteers here for, from voteforabroad.org here in the lobby to help you figure out how to do an absentee ballot. Unfortunately, non-Americans can't vote. Maybe that's a good thing, actually. But you can share, tweet, <laughs> poke, or otherwise your American friends. All they need is the website address, votefromabroad.org, and the Americans can sign up here. And finally, I have some good news for you. Not only is there quite a bit of heavy-duty crisis management going on in the Senate right now. There's also been some crisis management going on here in Amsterdam. Uh, 
while we have been sitting here, the books have arrived. Ah, good. So that means that you can buy your book, 13 euros, including 10% discount, thanks to our friends of Altenaeum Bookstore, who have absolutely done their utmost this evening to get the books here. Um, the only thing is, we don't have any sort of sale apparatus because this was crisis management. So You're giving them away. <laughs> we are actually are giving them to you this evening. Ateneum asked me to ask you to leave your name and your email address, uh, and then you'll get uh, an invoice later. But I'm very grateful to them for really going the last mile Trust. to get the books here. And if you already have the book, as I know many of you do, of course, Professor Ziblot will be happy to sign afterwards. And if you want to buy it in the bookstore, you can also get the 10% discount with the code John Adams 2020. Let us go forth and have a beer and celebrate the fact that we're still here, that <laughs> There's something exciting going on in the Senate and that we as voters can matter again. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you.